Hello, I'm Amy Allison. Welcome to this special program about the power of women of color within the Democratic Party to win elections. These women are the base of the base of the party and the core of the progressive movement. They bring with them an entirely new form of politics centered on social justice. In the coming hour, we'll show you how women of color are rising as both leaders and candidates for office, and how their voting power will play a crucial role in November's midterm elections. We'll also hear from some amazing women, Native American, Latina, Asian American, and Black, who are already leading the way forward to a more just and equal world. We'll talk with Ponca Wee Victors, a member of the Tejano Otham Nation of Arizona and the Ponca Tribe of Oklahoma, and the first Native American woman to serve in the Kansas legislature. Mary Gonzalez, state representative for Texas House District 75 and vice chair of the Mexican American Legislative Caucus. Sayu Bagwani, founder and president of New American Leaders. She previously served as New York City's first commissioner of immigrant affairs and Kimberly Ellis, who revolutionized democratic politics in California as the first African-American executive director in Emerge America's national network. This joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network is coming to you from El Barrio Firehouse Studio in East Harlem, New York. Before hearing from our guests, let's take a few minutes to bring you up to speed on the surge of empowerment that's begun sweeping the nation as hundreds of women of color run for office this year. Will Democratic Party power brokers learn to stop ignoring them and instead start listening and supporting them? Will funders and donors finally give them the backing they need to compete? And what might be the best path forward for progressives in the run-up to midterms? The biggest untold story of election 2018 is the role of women of color. Black, Latina, Pacific Islander, Middle Eastern, Asian American, Arab, and Native American women are now the strongest voices of resistance all over the country. They are at the core of the progressive movement and their collective voting power is key to victory in November's crucial midterm elections. From Georgia to California and from Florida to Texas, Women of color, now nearly 20% of the population, are emerging as leaders and candidates up and down the ballot. We bring with us a new form of politics, progressive and centered on social justice, leading to a new era. We are going to do what is right and what is good. Ultimately, all discrimination, whether it's anti-woman or anti-black, all discrimination is anti-human. America wasn't ready for Shirley Chisholm, but it must now reckon with a new generation of political powerhouses. Our dreamers deserve rights and freedoms in this country. Ninety-eight percent of black women voters in Alabama supported Doug Jones last December, ushering in the state's first Democratic senator in a quarter century. I have always believed that the people of Alabama had more in common than to divide us. Yet Democratic power brokers are unwilling to admit that women of color now drive the political narrative. Indeed, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee's list of endorsed candidates does not include any of the black women running competitive primaries. Instead, they cling to the past and stand in the way, posturing to white moderates and ignoring those of us who were the foundation of the party. Funders and donors still deny women candidates, especially those of color, the financial backing they need to compete. But an undeniable momentum is sweeping the nation. A surge of inspiration, empowerment, and support is propelling hundreds of women of color running for office this year, and the millions who will be voting for them, driving the change we need. You know, the time for taking that vote for granted is over, and so I am hoping that it is a wake-up call. Recent elections prove that we need to trust black women and other women of color. Soon Democrats and progressives will face a major test. Will they rally behind Stacey Abrams, the Georgia gubernatorial candidate who could make history as the nation's first black woman governor? This is a historic race. If I'm successful, I change the Deep South. 
it's not just that the South, other than Virginia, has never elected a black governor. It's not that in Georgia we've never had a woman governor or a black governor. It's that in America we've never had a black woman as the head of state. That is absurd and it is changeable. Abrams is already the first woman in person of color to serve as House Minority Leader in Georgia. Her platform appeals to a growing multiracial progressive bloc. Yet the Democratic establishment, in its zeal to court white working class voters, is backing moderate white candidate Stacey Evans, forcing a primary contest on May 22nd. And Abrams is not alone. Women of color seeking Democratic Party nominations are the most likely to face contested primaries. How long will Democrats continue to ignore our voices? My job is to convince Democrats, those who don't vote and those who voted for Barack Obama and then decided a game over, that you can trust me, that the message I have and the means I will employ will help you change your life. Historically, red Georgia is a new battleground state. Though no Democrat has won statewide in decades, rapidly changing demographics suggest Abrams can end this long losing streak. Black women make up 19% of Georgia's registered voters and 45% of Democrats voting in May. African Americans, together with voters from other communities of color, will become the state's majority electorate within 10 years. It's time to recognize Abrams as the future of Georgia politics. It's red in terms of our electoral politics. It is much more purple in terms of our demography and the way people live their lives. One of the reasons I'm running for governor is because I believe that we have to talk to everyone. The state of Georgia belongs to everyone who's there. Black women also delivered a Democratic victory in Virginia last year when 91 percent voted to elect Ralph Northam as governor. More than half of white women voted for Northam's Republican opponent, just as they supported Roy Moore in Alabama. Ever since those two races, black women voters can no longer be ignored. After Roy Moore's defeat, hashtag thank black women began trending. There were calls to thank us, support us, listen to us. Even DNC chair Tom Perez joined in the love fest, calling black women the backbone of the Democratic Party. But the party soon turned its back. Women of color demand more than gratitude. We need leaders who represent our interests. Democrats and progressives now face their moment of truth. Will they invest in women of color as voters and leaders in 2018? Or will they fall back on the same old strategy, spending millions on TV ads targeted at white swing voters, even after it led to crushing losses in state houses and Congress, not to mention the presidency itself? Of all the Democratic voters of color, more than half are women. Women of color must play a larger role in party politics. We are the base of the base and we deserve more. We are going to have to stand up and make demands that will make this country worthwhile. As a Democratic Party's most active and loyal voters, we will lead it to wins in 2018 in Georgia and beyond, while also making history by electing a record number of women of color. Texas primaries resulted in the election of the first two Latinas to Congress from the state, ousting white moderates in blue districts. And Texas is a state where 17 percent of the population are Latinas. It is a humbling thought that I can achieve something that Barbara Jordan and Shirley Chisholm and Shirley Franklin didn't achieve, that Carol Mosley Braun didn't achieve. Um, but what it also means is that I'm telling a story about who we can be. I'm telling a story about who America should be. And we believe in the power of our people to rise up and run our nation because together, if we work, if we speak, if we fight, if we believe, then we will have the power to change America. So let's get it done. Thank you so much. Welcome back. I'd like to begin by asking each of our guests to share some of the personal challenges they've faced in their political lives and how these might be emblematic of the larger issues facing all women of color. So let's start with you, Panka Wee Victors, of the number of Native women running for office this year is historic, yet no Native woman has ever served in Congress. 
I know. Can you believe that? Um, and so I'm excited to to uh, say that four indigenous women are running for Congress mm -hmm. and three are running for governor of, of their state. So, you know, I'm happy that they're stepping up to the plate and, and wanting to run for office, particularly Native women. I know we have some uh, women of color already in Congress, but the Native American woman, the Native American woman voice is missing at the table, and well, I think that's so yeah. important. Well, you started things off in Kansas as the first woman in the state legislature. You must have faced some challenges uh, being the first. Well, I always say it, it took us over 100 years to get there, but we made it. And so now that we're at the table, you know, it's, it's important to bring our issues and our concerns. Not only do I represent my diverse district back home in Wichita, but I also make sure that the four tribes of Kansas have, has a voice at the table as well. What was your experience? Getting into office, being a do being in office. It was like drinking water from a fire hose. Honestly, um, I didn't even know if I was going to make it my first week, let alone first day. Uh, I come from a, a ruby red state, <laughs> and so um, it, it's different, you know. It, but you have to put that to the side because then you have to think: if I'm not here at the table, then who else is? Who's representing me? And I got a first glimpse of that when I was an intern in D.C and I seen who was sitting at the table making those decisions for us, and that's when I really got interested in politics. Well, you bubbled up, at least on, in my awareness, uh, because I've never even been to Kansas, and I can tell you, when I saw you give that speech on the floor of the House floor around immigration a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. it was really electric. Tell, tell me about that, what what led to that whole exchange? Well, I think it I might have been in my second term. So you know, as a Native American, um, we're taught to sit back and kind of watch, uh, watch the process. We're not ones to like dig right in. We kind of see who's with who and and kind of watch the process. But yet, when we see something, we will. Speak speak up. A lot of times you have legislators who are constantly shooting, I always say using their bullets up, you know, and, and, and a lot of people don't even pay attention, you know, um, but me particularly, immigration is huge in my district because I represent a lot of uh, Latinos, a lot of undocumented students, and the Dreamers are in my district as well, and so it's my, I feel like it's it's up to me to protect them, no matter what, no matter where they come from or who they are or uh, what color skin, you know. And so when that issue came up about immigration, um, I just had enough. And I had seen the, the faces in the crowd of dreamers who had come there to talk down this bad anti-immigration uh, legislation to repeal the DREAM Act in Kansas. And the faces were just, you know, they, they were sad, they were sickening, uh, they were disgusted of being called illegal aliens over and over and over. Uh, we're not, um, nobody should be called an illegal alien. We're, we're all, you know, um, we're all people of this, of this universe. And so when I, when I heard that and integrating them, I had to say something. And I didn't know it, it would make, you know, national news. But I was doing that for them because somebody needed to stick up for them. And I just felt, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and say that because our Secretary of State kept saying, in my role as a citizen. In my, so that's why I said, in my role as a Native American woman. You know, who's the illegal immigrant here? <laughs> and when you want to talk about immigration. Well, he wasn't happy to hear that. He <laughs> wasn't, but, you know, hey, he was quiet after that. So it worked. <laughs> so. Hey, all right. In 2018, this dude same guy yes is running for higher office yes mm -hmm. he is and it's scary um, because a lot of his policies are geared not only toward you know um, the undocumented community in Kansas but people in people of color in in general whether it's voting rights or whether it's immigration you know whether it's med med medical issues or medica uh, Medicaid expansion things that we could benefit in our state you know he is totally against and so I'm doing what I can to try to gear up uh, and not and I don't want people to forget about we got primaries too mm -hmm. you know those are just as important as the general election yeah well, you know, Mary Gonzalez, you know about being first oh. out in East Texas. <laughs> first woman, 
-hmm. and first woman from my district, first LGBT woman in Texas, uh, youngest Democrat on the House floor. <laughs> I mean, we we broke a lot of ceilings with that <laughs> one. How did you do it? It's a freak accident. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, um, a little bit. No, you know. Um, if you would have told me six years ago I was going to be a state rep, I would have never believed you. I was a professor, I was teaching, and in fact, when um, Annie's List came and asked me to run for office, I, I told them no. And it was my students who said, you know, Mary, you're being a hypocrite. You tell us every day to go out and change the world, to be at the forefront, to take risks, to be brave, and here they're asking you to do the same thing and you're not doing it. And I'm like... I'm such a great professor. And then I realized I wanted to practice what I preached. Mm -hmm. So I quit my job and I decided to jump in. And I was running um, 27 at the time against four guys, all elected officials, all part of the infrastructure, and nobody knew who I was. Um, nobody, I mean, really, no one knew who I was. And we just kept on talking to voters and talking about issues. and. We won, and we broke all those glass ceilings. And people told me, like, there's no way a queer, feminist, woman of color, uh, progressive gets elected in rural uh, West Texas. And uh, we did that. So we're yes, very but proud. what don't people know about where you live? There's something. There's something that you were able to tap into. Well, I just think I think the struggle is in my community for generations, for decades. People have been really encouraged not to be part of the democratic process, right? There has been um, ways in which to, to, to limit Latino vote, specifically on the border. And so I'm not talking about issues that they care about. So here you have someone who wants everybody to be engaged, is willing to go door to door, is willing to talk about issues like, for example, in my district, we have 263 colonias. These are communities that don't have sewer, water, um, some don't have electricity. When I talk to my colleagues across the state, I say, I'm fighting for the, the, the right for my constituents to be able to flush the toilet. Like, that's what I'm fighting for, things that people take for granted every single day. Um, I'm fighting for equity in public school funding. So I think what people didn't realize is that there was a thirst, a need for someone to talk about the real issues impacting my community, um, but really engage. Uh, in, engage the community in a one-to-one -one level, not in an elitist way, in a very authentic, honest um, way to, get to really th think, talk about the things that they need done. Yeah. Well, I'm going to just tur turn over and really start talking about the statewide because um, last year, um, Kimberly um, Ellis, you ran uh, for chair of the party in California, the Democratic Party in California, and, and you, you took on uh, establishment Democrats. What happened? Yeah. Well, not only did we take on establishment Democrats, we took on the establishment itself. Um, and uh, what happened was, I think, what happens to a lot of women of color um, when they choose to stand up and speak out uh, and speak truth to power. Uh, and that is we, uh, we got the wrath of, uh, of the institution, of the machine. Um, you know, ours was a campaign that really ran on the premise of redefining what it meant to be a Democrat. Uh, there are many of us in the party uh, who believe that, in many ways, the party as an institution and many of our leaders at the highest levels have forgotten what it means to be a Democrat, uh, that we are no longer the party of the people. And so ours was a campaign to uh, give the party back to the people, uh, to get back to being that party of the poor, of the working class, uh, the party that fights for the voiceless. And um, what I experienced, um, again, I think is what a lot of women of color experience on the campaign trail. Um, I experienced uh, in your face racism, uh, sexism, um, threats, bullying uh, within our beloved Democratic Party. And really, I think a, a sentiment of, um, you know, who, who gave you permission uh, to do this. No one asked you. In many ways, um, they say this is our party, but it really isn't. Uh, and so um, I think for me, really what it, what it showed was that um, um, you know, power concedes nothing. Mm -hmm. It never has and it never will. Well, you came close. Yes. You um, came close. <laughs> truth it, be it, told, yeah. yeah. So, um, but for an antiquated uh, super delegate system, if you will. Um, we won the popular vote of the elected delegation, uh, but the institution uh, flooded the system, if you will, uh, with super delegate votes uh, and crushed the will of the people in favor of continuing and maintaining the status quo. And this, 
Talk, talk to me about what that means to be a black woman running to lead the party in the bluest state when black women are the core of the Democratic Party. Yeah, um, yeah. Twenty-five percent of all members of the Democratic Party are black, and more than half of them are women. Yeah. Yeah. What does that say to you? Well, what it says to me is that there's a lot of doublespeak uh, within the Democratic Party. Uh, what it says to me is that um, the Democratic Party talks a good game, uh, that they uh, want our loyalty, our uh, commitment, uh, but they're not willing to invest in us, uh, either as uh, a community or as candidates. Um, and what it says to me is that we as women of color, and particularly black women who are the backbone of the Democratic Party, uh, need to stop investing in interests uh, that don't serve our interests. Uh, and so, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, really what it all came down to was um, and what I think all politics comes down to, and that is money and power. It really was about who gets to sit at the head of that table and make decisions that impact people's economic, social, political well-being or not well-being. It's about who gets to decide um, who can pollute and who gets polluted. <laughs> well, we're going to be talking a lot more about that. But what is, is some of what Kimberly saying, Sayu Bhagwani, in your role as the founder of the New American Leaders uh, training program, you work with a lot of Asian Pacific Islander and Latino uh, candidates. It, does this sound familiar in terms of the people that you've worked oh, with? Oh, every, everything that everyone has said. Mm -hmm. I've just been shaking my head and thinking about how these stories, uh, you know, you, you, you wish they were the exception, but they're, you hear them over and over and over. And, and I think you, what, what we hear and what Kimberly is talking about is that there's a system that has worked for a certain group of people. And so when we're talking about critiquing a system, the people who have already benefited from that system aren't seeing the same problems that we're seeing. We see the problems because the system never really worked for us. And, and so this broken machine of the Democratic Party, the broken system of our democracy, that was frankly never meant to work for us. I mean, remember, we couldn't vote mm -hmm. until well after white landowning men could vote. And so the fact that we're far behind is no coincidence, right, as women of color. It was always meant to be this way. And it's taken a long time, like you said, 100 years to get you in office, someone like you, Pankawe, mm -hmm. in office. So it's going to take a long time of breaking down a system that was never meant to work for us. So I think money and power and who decides who's going to have that money and power. Uh, and you know, Mary and I were talking informally earlier that often when we think about money and power, and particularly about money, we think about how much it costs to run a campaign. But many of us are even shut out from the decision to run for office because we don't have the kind of independent wealth that makes it possible for Mary to be able to serve only 140 days every two years in the Texas State Legislature. A lot of people don't realize that our legislators are people who ha ha are able to just work part time and then go up to their state capitals. It's one of the reasons why so many women often don't run for state legislature. Right, so I'm thinking about all of these women who are running historic numbers of women of color from all of our communities. Mm -hmm. What are they facing and what have they faced? So just let me just hear, yeah. what, what are the kind of things they're dealing with right now? I just said last week we had a training, my organization which trains first and second generation Americans to run for office. We had a women's only training last mm -hmm. week and someone asked about um, what to wear on the campaign trail. And I said, you know, you can't win because if you dress up, I talk to candidates and they say when they dress up, their constituents say, why are you so dressed up? Are you on a fashion show? <laughs> then I talk to others where the constituents say, well, you know, we want you to dress up more. You don't look like a council person. <laughs> so you really can't win. So you just wear what you feel comfortable in and what you feel confident in. Because that's one example. I hear that story uh, across the board in right. different ways. Right. What else? Well, I mean, here's what I will say. I'm a little building on what all these wonderful women have said. I love the Democratic Party because I think it does create an avenue to create change. But what I think we ignore is that um, racism and sexism and heterosexism and classism and ableism and anti-Semitism 
our party is not immune to those things. So where is the strategy and the intentionality to say we are not, we're going to resist those things, and we're going to make sure that at the ma macro levels, we are actively working to break down those systems. At the micro level, so women like all of us can run for office, are being supported and uplifted. And so what are, we, what are women, women of color dealing with in a campaign trail? They're dealing with everything from what do I wear? I mean, there was blogs about my weight to what I drive to. They're dealing with the 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 the, the, um, the microscope on them, while at the same time trying to 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 navigate the larger structures of racism and sexism. Yeah, yeah. well said, well said. All right, in a moment, we're going to take an in-depth look at how women of color are now setting the progressive agenda for the crucial midterm elections this fall, driving the change we need and leading the Democratic Party to victory while also making history. I'm Amy Allison. You're watching a joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Welcome back. I'd like to begin the next part of our discussion by asking Kimberly Ellis what the lessons that you learned that the progressive movement needs to learn uh, based on your experience in California. Yeah. Well, what I learned is that people are hungry for and thirsty for change, real change. Um, I believe that the Democratic Party and in particular the progressive movement uh, led by women of color is the best thing the Democratic Party has going for it right now. I believe that there is one lie that holds the entire system of oppression together. And that lie is that the system cannot be beat. And I think that what our campaign demonstrated was that not only can the system be beat, but the system is so old and so antiquated and so out of touch with reality that the truth of the matter is, in many instances, they have to resort to cheating in order to actually beat progressive female candidates. Um, and so I think one of the biggest takeaways is that people are done and fed up with mediocrity. Like yeah. People always talked about the difference, you know, when you look at the 2016 election uh, as, though the, the Democratic Party is at war with itself between the Clinton supporters mm -hmm. and the Bernie Sanders. Is it more complicated than that? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yes and no. Yes and no. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely more complicated than that. But I think the point that Kimberly is making in some ways is a very simple one. And Mary sort of mm -hmm. hinted at that. The thing that gets lost in the machinations and the polling and the consulting is the fact that the voters really care about what you're talking to them about. They want to understand that you care about them, and that you care about their issues, and that you are going to go there and stand up like Pankawe did and fight for them when the time I is right. We, we have a, a, a person occupying the White House. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to mm. yeah, yeah. yeah. break it. <laughs> okay, we have a person occupying the White person House. Person might not be the person right Person is the yeah. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> occupying the White House who uses racism, and he's backed by a whole lot of, uh, of Republicans on the national level to whip up support, mm -hmm. right? So w in the Democratic Party, if, if, if I do not hear people ready, willing, and able to combat, I'm looking specifically at you, Mary, mm -hmm. are they willing to fight for racial justice? Do mm -hmm. they even know how? Mm -hmm. If they're a Democrat and they call themselves progressive and they don't do it, well, that, and that's a struggle. We just mm -hmm. assume that because you're a Democrat, you should be, you know how to do this. And I don't think a lot of a, a lot of folks do, right? And I I'm from Texas, right? So I, I I come from a state that has a lot of Democrats, but maybe older Southern Democrats. And I'm still I'm still wanting people to um, just really speak out to some of the things happening, not only at the federal level, but at state levels, local levels, because those things are trickling down to some of our communities. I think what's really important, kind of what I've been hearing also, is one of the struggles for women of color is this traditional leadership model that exists within the Democratic Party. So when I got elected, it was like, don't speak up. Just wait your mm -hmm. turn. Um, don't speak so loudly. Stop talking about those issues. Don't use those words from the LGBT movement. Like, and so there was a lot of trying to police my authenticity, mm -hmm. right? When the people in my district needed authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so th the, the struggle of balancing authenticity to be effective, but really wanting to be authentic to, to, to try to challenge traditional leadership styles because that's the only mm -hmm. way we're ever going to change things. Yeah, I, I mean, I was thinking about um, in red states where you yeah. have a Democrat mm -hmm. like Connor mm -hmm. Lamb, who mm -hmm. just won the special mm -hmm. election, um, who's a Democrat, 
I mean, the, the Republican he was running against was, you know, if he gets an F, Connor Lamb, in my view, gets a C mm -hmm. or a C minus mm -hmm. because he's not a progressive champion. And so, mm -hmm. what do we do in situations like that? You're coming from a state where you are you saying it's a red it. state? Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I live yeah. it every day. Um, and so, for me, what has worked for me is educate my colleagues uh, when we're discussing like Native American issues on on the floor. Um, I educate everybody. It seems, and it can get tiring, but. You know, before I'm a, a party or what, I'm a Native American woman. This is who I am and, you know, I can't hide it. And so I have to educate others. And, and yeah, I get some crazy questions, you know, um, but I just have to, uh, you know, listen to what they have to say and then I have to educate them on different things. Right, right. So that has helped me in Kansas. And it, you know what? It's worked because I've, I've had the Indian tribes come to the Capitol and I've even put it in law that the first Wednesday of the legislative session is reserved for them and their issues to talk with our legislators. Mm -hmm. So they look forward to it, you know, sometimes we uh, bring in um, our Native American traditional foods for the legislators and, and that they get more comfortable seeing us around the Capitol because a lot of times they say, well, we don't see Native Americans here at the Capitol, they must not have no issues. Mm -hmm. Or we don't see Latinos here, they must not care. You know, so we have to educate and, and, and it works both sides too. I have to tell the, the tribes that it's important that your presence is there. Yeah, yeah, and, and, <laughs> it's like a yes and. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, we are talking about the kinds of candidates right now that are on the ballot in 2018 Often we're told, and in red states this is true of Democrats, but it's also in a place like California, um, okay, you, 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 it's better to be a little bit softer, more moderate, more, you know, mm -hmm. to appeal to a broader, how do you, you know, the whole debate within mm -hmm. the Democratic Party, how do you mm -hmm. make sense of all that? Where do you stand on that? Should we go hard, mm -hmm. be more moderate, more, you know? Yeah, I think we should go real. Mm -hmm. I think we should be real, and I think that instead of talking about who has which letter behind their name, a D or an R, we should really be talking about issues that impact people across the board, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes uh, that the Democratic Party has made uh, in the past uh, several years um, is moving away from being a party that actually talks to people. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we talked about in my campaign for chair was changing the way we spent the money that flowed through the party. So instead of spending millions and millions of dollars on TV and mail, instead investing that money in people in the form of field organizers who would organize all over the state of California, not just in our blue strongholds, but specifically in our purple areas, our red areas, and our um, areas that are not uh, blue, you know, democratic strongholds. Um, knock on doors, talk to people about issues that affect their everyday lives. That is how you win over people, not just bringing back the people, because the truth of the matter is, no party preference, decline to state, and independent registration is outpacing democratic registration by four to one. So in an effort to not just bring those people back, but move beyond party ID, um, that's what we have to get back to. Being that party that isn't afraid to talk to people um, instead of the easy route, TV and mail and those kinds of things. Yeah. But it's about yeah. what do you, yeah. how do you spend your money? Yeah. Do you believe in investing your money in people or you, do you believe in not investing your money in people? Right. Does that surprise you? I mean, the way that our food tastes are, are changing, we don't, we don't want some variation of the same old thing. And I think that applies even within the Democratic Party, the sort of, if we think about the 2016 election, the options that we had, mm -hmm. they weren't necessarily hugely radical, they weren't necessarily hugely authentic. Mm -hmm. I know that people thought of Bernie Sanders as very authentic, but for me, he wasn't representing something that I could get behind because in no, the he end he's going to run for president well probably. this again. is you know and and so I think that we're I mean again going I think Kimberly is stating this so beautifully <laughs> like it's actually a very simple issue we need to listen to people when people are voting for Mary they're not thinking oh this is an LGBT Latina they're thinking this is someone in my district yeah because all I'm thinking about the vibrant movement movements the women's march led by a group of, a multiracial group of right. women of color. Um, even the, the 
uh, the new March for Our Lives movement led the by dreamers. right mm -hmm. the Dreamers. Mm -hmm. There's some amazing movements happening, and those are led by women uh, women of mm -hmm. color, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. as well. Um, so we have that in terms of movement. So I got to ask you, what's the women of color agenda? If we could define one right now. I think it's the same agenda my mother had for me as a child, right? Making sure we have great schools, healthy water. I mean, that's a real thing for a lot of people yeah. across the country. They, they you know, still don't have access to clean water. Um, doctors and, you know, just basic, really the basic needs. And I think that all these marches that you're talking about, that's just about safety, your li being alive, mm -hmm. um, ha being able to be not, not scared of the police, whether you're an immigrant or whether you're a person of color or whether you're, you know, you know any of the, uh, just thinking more critically about the basic needs of human beings is I think really what women of color have always, not just now, but have historically been fighting for. And I think now we're just fighting for our table and, and in politics to get that work done. And then once you're at the table, you have to prove that you can sit at the table. Yeah. You know, one, a lot of times it's, it's good that we get everybody elected, but once you get there at the table, you have to prove to others that you're qualified to be there and that you have a right to sit there and have input on different issues that directly affect all of us. You mean being elected is not enough. Mm. You no. Have to do <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a whole other story. I always say the minute I come into a room, I always feel like, three strikes are against me, mm -hmm. which I think they're blessings, but others use them as strikes is, is you know, I'm, I'm brown, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a woman, you know, and I'm a Democrat mm -hmm. <laughs> in a red state. Mm -hmm. So I always feel like that's always on my back the minute I sit down at a table. But you know, it also helps too to build those relationships with your colleagues so they can try to start seeing past the barriers. Like, you know, she is, a pretty cool person or you know she is okay you know I might back her on this mm. issue yeah I would offer that a, w a woman's agenda uh, is an agenda that values humanity and that puts people in our planet first um, one of the things that we talked about on my campaign was um, that as Democrats we should fight for fairness and justice and equity for everyone and we should not fighting, uh, stop fighting for that until everyone gets that. And so one of the um, sort of pieces of pushback that I got was, well, you know, uh, California is the big blue progressive liberal bastion for the country. Uh, we have a supermajority in our legislature. Uh, all of our constitutional officers are Democrat. We have a Democratic governor. Uh, what more work is there to be done mm -hmm. in California, I was asked. And then I had to remind them that even in big blue California, uh, we still uh, were number one in terms of poverty, number one in terms of homelessness. Uh, Kern County, uh, which is in the Central Valley, has the worst air quality in the entire country. Uh, we send more of our citizens to prisons than we do to schools. Um, there is much, much more work to be done uh, in the state of California and in the rest of this country. And I think that a woman's agenda is an agenda that recognizes that, that recognizes that um, we, uh, those of us who choose to be in public service, are there to serve uh, the least among us. And we will not stop until everyone um, has an opportunity to live to their fullest potential. Why is Kimberly, why are you not running for governor? <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear there's a race. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I hear there's, <laughs> there's a race. And it's true. Uh, both of you have worked uh, to, to prepare candidates, both mm. Emerge California yes. and New American Leaders. And, yes. you, you know, how are you getting this new crop of women, not only to redefine or define the women's agenda, but to move forward because there are so many that have stood, uh, stood up for office, but they're yeah. well, needing to be prepared for that. I mean, you know, you mentioned Isela Blanc, who actually got elected in 2016, and mm -hmm. um, Isela is a woman who was formerly undocumented and mm -hmm. was elected in Arizona in the same year that uh, the current person in the White House was elected. So I think that there is sometimes a narrative at the local and state level that can be very different from mm -hmm. the national one, which is not to say that there is not racism or sexism. But I wanna, I, I think one of the roles that we play as women of color and as candidates of color is to fight for justice instead of just charity. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that even progressives are really guilty of. They're, they're guilty of, and deploying charity mm -hmm. in response to people of color. 
to say, here, you can come and sit at the table if you're quiet, if you follow the rules. Is this, I, um, <laughs> I take umbrage with the uh, use of the term minority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, me too. I, in, in a political yeah. context, actually, it doesn't, in California and six other states, people mm -hmm. of color are already the majority, mm -hmm. and right. that's going to be our entire country in a couple of decades. So we, we uh, or one day, was it? Yeah. Yeah, well, so and, like, and language is powerful, right? So absolutely. the symbolism when you say, right. oh, they're minorities, you, you automatically put communities and histories and cultures and people down, mm -hmm. right? And so, right. yeah, I totally agree with yeah. you. Yeah, but yeah, when we say Latinos are 17% of the population in Texas, in Texas mm -hmm. Latinos, Latinas are, have enough voting power right. to actually choose a statewide representative, a senator or a governor. So and so, if we keep turnout. on calling people our communities minority, then then we then we internalize that, right? That's and right. I, yeah, yeah. Is, and language is strategic. These words aren't Absolutely. by accident. There's an intentional reason these words exist. I, I couldn't agree more. And I was going to say one of my favorite uh, trainers in the Emerge California program is a woman by the name of Jonah Olson, who says, "Be very careful uh, with the labels that you allow people to put on you." And that as women of color. We are not minorities, but in fact, we should start calling ourselves what we truly are, and that is the global majority. Mm. As women of color, that is who we are. Uh, and start using that um, so that people can start internalizing that mm. and the force behind that. Yeah, and that how that uh, manifests uh, this year in the midterms, and I'll just you know ask mm. anyone to jump in, but like women of color uh, as, a, as a voting block, and we saw this in Alabama, mm -hmm. where black women with a high turnout mm -hmm. were able to choose uh, to, to choose and make the, the decision for uh, this, that special Senate race. 7% of the population uh, has that power, mm -hmm. and their women of color are higher percentages in other states. Mm -hmm. So it's we're we're well, voters. We, well, also you know. when you say women of color, there are forces that exist to keep apart the Latino community and the Asian American right. community and the Native American community, and black community. Mm -hmm. So when you say women of color, you're automatically creating a coalition. You're resisting right. the forces that are trying to separate us. Is this a thing right now, women of color? Is it, do people recognize this as a political block right now? I mean, I ha I do. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do I think there needs to be more strategy to de develop this coalition? Do I think that once we start to internalize that power, that p that the powers that be will feel in and therefore try to create a divisiveness culture that's th that they have had for a long time, sure. Yeah. But do I think there's potential in continuing to build on a women of color movement? Yes, definitely. Well, and yeah. I would also offer that the Democratic Party and other institutions of power that neglect mm -hmm. to recognize the power of that block do so at their peril. Here, 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 right? <laughs> yeah, here. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna come back to it. Um, I wanna thank you all. Uh, we'll be back in a moment to look at some specific candidates and races that we should all keep an eye on in the coming months. I'm Amy Allison and you're watching a Free Speech TV MNN joint production. Stay with us. Welcome back. Let's begin with Mary Gonzalez. Texas recently elected the first two Latinas to Congress. And 17% uh, of the population in your state, as we mentioned earlier, is Latina. So really my question is, are there similar races around the country that we should be looking at around Latinas as they emerge as, as powerhouses. I mean, definitely, but I will say these two races in Texas are historic. Texas, a huge Latino population, was part of Mexico, and we still had never elected a Latina to Congress. I mean, these two races, um, Senator Garcia and Ron Judge Veronica Escobar um, co going to Congress are, is, is um, life-changing. Uh, obviously, there's other races of women of color. I love Stacey Abrams. She's a great friend of mine. Um, you, know, you have all these types of women running for office. Yeah. But, uh, but I think it's really historic for Texas right now. Texas is an interesting one because uh, <laughs> the occupier of the White House <laughs> won the state by 800,000 uh, votes in a state that has 1.6 million eligible Latinos in general, and then women alone could actually close that gap. Well, I mean, and we have our first Latina uh, uh, LGBT woman running for governor, right? Like if yeah. you would have told me five years ago, I mean, as a queer woman of color, I always tell people there's no way I could ever run for governor. And now you have someone who's yeah. just like me running for governor. It's it's life changing, really. Yeah. What are the other races you're watching uh, for, for um, the midterms? For the Native American uh, women. Uh, we are watching Paulette Jordan, who mm -hmm. is a friend of mine, but she's also running for governor in Idaho. And then we have Deb uh, Holland, who is running for Congress in New Mexico, which is a heavily populated 
highly populated Native American state. And then in my own state of Kansas, we have Sharice Davis who's running for Congress. So it's exciting to see all these women of color and who look like you, who come from, for me, from tribal nations that are stamping up to the plate and running for office. So, and Paulette Jordan was recently uh, endorsed by Cher. Oh. So, you know, it's oh. just oh. not us, yeah. but it's a wide variety. Yes. Of Russian races too, so it's very exciting. That yeah. is. Yeah. That's it. How, how about you? Well, I'm watching the two races in Michigan. Rashida Tlaib, mm -hmm. who is running uh, for Congress in the seat vacated by John Conyers. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a competitive primary. And then Farouz Saad is also running in Michigan. Uh, so both of them theoretically could be first Muslim women in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of historic uh, races. Uh, Nadia Hashimi is running in Maryland, uh, could be the first Afghan American in Congress. Uh, there's a couple more. I mean, Pramila Jayapal made history mm -hmm. when she became the first Indian American woman in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, but this year, Aruna Miller is also running. Um, Dr. Hero won a race in Arizona. So there's going to be a lot more Indian American women in Congress, I think. So I'm mm -hmm. excited about that. And then there's a great race in California. Mekhan Tran is running um, in also a seat that's been vacated. Vacated by, by a, a big Trump light. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, Republican. yes, we won't say names. Um, <laughs> and Mekhan is amazing. She's a doctor. She came here as a Vietnamese refugee. She was a farm worker. She has an amazing story. And she's a first time candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, Aruna Miller, who's a delegate in Maryland, is not a first time candidate and Rashida Tlaib also not a first time candidate. So it'll be really, what I'm really intrigued by is how many of the first time candidates for Congress are actually going to win because you know, conventional wisdom has it that you want to run for a local or state race first. And I think unlike much political convention wisdom, I've been a staunch believer of that, that you want to have a base that you're building on when you run for Congress. But this year, even I'm like, yeah, man, let's go get Anything it. Can can happen. Happen. <laughs> do. Anything can happen. What can we do? Well, even if a fraction of these women succeed, they're making history. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to say one thing about this is that these women who are running are coming from all sorts of backgrounds. So Maykan is a doctor. Nadia Hashimi is a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hero in Arizona. And what happens when you come to policy making? with this kind of intersectional approach, mm -hmm. with being you know, a medical professional, being a working class person, being an immigrant or refugee, and you bring all of that into the conversation about healthcare, mm -hmm. into the conversation about immigration. You're not just bringing one aspect of identity, and I think often that gets lost in the conversation about women of color or immigrants, that we're bringing only that perspective and we're only gonna serve those constituents. But Mekan in Congress is going to be thinking about her patients. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and before, I just wanted to ask, what are the races you're looking at? Yeah, well, I think uh, for many of us, uh, all eyes are on Georgia. Uh, yeah. In, yeah. in many mm -hmm. respects, and I think that uh, a win for Stacey Abrams uh, is not just a win for black women, it's not just a win for women of color, um, it's not just a win for Georgia, but it's a win for this country. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that is definitely number one on my list of, of races I'm looking at. Uh, there's a young woman, um, uh, Marticia Johnson, who is running for Nashville uh, Public Defender, which is in my home state of Tennessee. Um, there's also Pam Keith, who's running for Congress down in Florida. Uh, Lucy Macbeth uh, is running for Congress in Georgia. And um, you may recall her son, Jordan Davis, was the young man who was murdered uh, in the parking lot in Jacksonville, Florida, because uh, someone disagreed with the music that he was playing. So I think it's incredible that this woman who had a 30-year career with Delta Airlines um, uh, was led uh, to activism uh, through through that act, and now wants to fight on behalf of other of other folks in her, in her community. And then finally, I would say I really have a thing right now for women who are running for uh, law enforcement positions. Right. So, uh, in my home state of California, we have uh, Dina Becton, who's running for district attorney in my home county of Contra Costa. Uh, there's Pamela Price, who's running for district attorney in Contra Costa County, and a, a, a firebrand uh, Genevieve uh, Jones Wright, who is running for DA down in San Diego. So a lot of incredible races mm -hmm. uh, all across the country. And a lot of focus, we'll talk about uh, Congress, but these local Absolutely. races have so oh. much impact on people's so lives. So much. Especially black and brown people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a, a focus on DAs. 95% yep. of DAs are white yep. mm -hmm. and a, a mostly male. 
mostly conservative. Yep. And so imagine yeah. uh, these women of color yeah. running and winning in these seats. Yeah, and bringing a justice lens uh, to right. the to the offices that they will hold. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. that's kind of what you were talking about, and how, if you've been talking about what women of color bring more than just identities. They bring um, all these other parts of, their, of themselves into it. Mm -hmm. And policy making should be complex. And I think lately we feel it should be simple just so people can understand. And mm -hmm. I don't think people want that. I think they want complexity because that's what, sol I mean, that's what it actually solves problems. And you know, one of the struggles I had when I came into office is people couldn't get beyond uh, that I was LGBT or that I was young or that I was Latina and I had to really make them see well I'm also an academic mm -hmm. I'm also a farmer I'm also the daughter of you know a Republican and a Democrat and the oldest of 11 the hu um, some of these ways in which we put women of color in boxes mm -hmm. dehumanizes them in some ways so we have to be really careful to uplift them but not let their identities dehumanize them and allow them to be their holistic selves to humanize them so they can create humanistic policy yeah well it sounds like the very thing that was looked at as a weakness is actually the strength mm -hmm. in this modern day mm -hmm. right now with what we're facing across the country it's the great strength mm -hmm. all right well i want to just talk about what be what a women's agenda really looks like. And um, if we talk about intersectionality, which is really what you're suggesting, Professor, <laughs> some sometimes people don't know what intersectionality uh, is. Mm. How would you explain it in a simple way? Mm. I'll say, I think often people think about intersectionality as being related to one's identity, having different sort of, you know, woman of color, women, immigrant, et cetera. Um, and I don't think that that is entirely wrong, but I also think that it's the approach that you bring mm. to your work and your policy making that's really critical because I can be all of these things uh, and not choose to lean into them. Mm. So for me, uh, and I really follow Rinku Sen who um, is a great thinker on these issues, uh, I feel that the, the most important part of it is the approach. The fact that you're bringing an intersectional approach. Pramila Jayapal talks about, you know, I'm not an immigrant on Tuesday and a woman on Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm getting, getting my days of the week <laughs> wrong. But you bring all of that together when you're making a decision about policy making. One last thing I'll say is when, when I was serving as Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs for New York City, often what would happen is people would come to the office, other elected, uh, other city officials, and say, well, you know, we have this policy and we just want to translate it in three languages so that communities can understand this new health policy. And that's an example of something that can be very, you know, it, it is very dehumanizing because it, it takes something that hasn't been thought through with an approach that reflects the realities mm -hmm. of people who might be concerned about interacting with the health system, might not speak the language, but might have additional concerns and just translating something does not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Really understanding where people are coming from and bringing all of those perspectives to the making of policy and then to the communication of that policy, to me, is one way of thinking about intersectionality. All the identities, mm -hmm. all, the, all, the, all, the, all the identities. It's your identity, you, you can't fight it, it's yeah. who you are. Yes, except you that. Know? We're hearing from exactly. the Democrats that identity politics should be you know, left yeah. out of things. Mm -hmm. That's never going to happen, not for me. I, when, I, when I represent, I represent everything you know I represent everybody I represent who I am as a person you know a lot of times I might not vote Democrat the way Democrats want me to vote because my Native American culture will come into play you know or, or maybe you know talking about religious values or religious freedom or whatever my Native American values might come in or my traditions or and I have an opportunity to talk about my ceremonies and what I do as a Native American woman so you know those kind of things come up at the Capitol and once again, it's an opportunity to educate, you know, and, and, and I always say it's, it's good to have uncom um, uncomfortable conversations. That's when you really get to the core and get to the root of what's really happening and how we can move forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I talk to you about women overall? Mm -hmm. uh, when, in, in, when I was growing up, there was a women's agenda that was a lot about reproductive rights and, mm -hmm. uh, and it was very centered on white women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. White women as a group uh, have for last uh, uh, 40 years and particularly uh, in the last couple of years we've seen uh, supported Trump and continue to support uh, very regressive uh, agendas. So 
How has the women's movement changed then? What is the modern women's movement? Yeah, well, one could argue that it hasn't changed much. Um, I think that um, one of the things that I love what you just said about um, difficult conversations, one of the mantras that we had on my campaign was um, having the courage to facilitate difficult conversations and tell hard truths. And the hard truth of the matter is that the women's uh, movement and community as it stands today um, has a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, there are a lot of hard truths and difficult conversations that need to be had with our white sisters, uh, quite honestly. Uh, truth be told, um, um, when it comes to women of color in politics, in many instances, it's not the men who are our worst enemies, it is white women. Mm -hmm. And so um, being, uh, being confident enough in ourselves and who we are and what we stand for to, to facilitate those conversations, uh, because I believe that um, we will not be able to talk around these issues, under these issues, or over these issues. We're gonna have to talk through these issues. And until we have those kinds of conversations within the women's community and within the women's movement, we will continue to be a stalled movement. If our white sisters will not come on board, move back, make room at the table for us, uh, we will create our own tables and we will start leading uh, without, uh, you know, without them. Yeah, I think I, I, you're completely right. And I think it talks about the complexity of intersectionality. Um, and so, for, for example, when you said there's folks in the Democratic Party who want to get rid of identity politics, right? And I say, I don't want to get rid of it, but I want to make it complex, right? And you shouldn't just get elected because you are a woman, right? right. Because there are, there was a- There was terrible women. There were terrible women, and there were terrible men. But, but, but there, was, there, was a, there was a race um, in Texas a couple years back, and they're like, well, she's a woman, we all need to support her. And I'm like, but she has openly said right. she's anti-LGBT adoption, right? And so I'm like, no, just because she's a woman, I don't need to go just to go support her because there's complexity to and that. And it's about governance. Right. It's about the agenda. Yes. Is what you're really well, and, and you're pointing so, to. And that's what I'm talking so we do I want to have, because there's this really great quote by the Victory Fund that says, um, if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. Yeah. And I love, <laughs> I love that. that too. Uh, yeah. But but Yes, we want diversity at the table, but it has to be more complex than just filling out the box. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we yeah. have a woman now. Oh, we have a person of color. And, bec and because, and it speaks to the real issues that you were talking about, right? And so, um, because then if we say, but then that, uh, that challenges, again, white women to think more complexly about their role mm -hmm. in the political sphere because I've had to yeah. deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. And we're almost out of time, <laughs> and I am so <laughs> loving this. And I want to just ask, you in particular, but all of us, what's your best hope mm. for the work, um, your own leadership, but also in this conversation for that next generation? Well, I think already that we are setting a standard for the next generation that it can be done. We're showing little girls out there who are watching TV and they see somebody that looks like them you know, vying for a place in Congress or at the table, and it gives them hope because when I grew up, I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So I had to create my own role model for myself and what I wanted to do. And, you know, now that I'm here, I'm hoping that I can help bring up another little girl like me or who looks like me and encourage them that they can do it. If I can do it, you know, I didn't grow up rich, I didn't grow up going to private school. I grew up poor, but I'm not ashamed of that because it brought me here and I'm humble about it. Mm -hmm. So if I can do it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We're just about out of time. Uh, just please join me in thanking our wonderful, amazing, stellar and brilliant guests on this joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you, Ponka Wee Victors, for your insights about the Native communities long marginalized mm -hmm. by the U.S. voting laws, but now moving into mainstream politics. Thank you, Mary Gonzalez, educating us about how uh, the Latino community has awoken and is roaring and is coming into life and leadership, thanks to, in large part, to Latinas just like you. Mm -hmm. Sayu Bhagwani, thank mm -hmm. you so much for helping to lead the movement for an inclusive democracy by preparing first and second generation Americans, many, many of them women, mm -hmm. to gain elected office. And thank you, Kimberly Ellis, for your efforts to increase the number of Democratic women leaders from diverse backgrounds in public office through recruitment, training, and network, and for your own courageous run in California. From the Manhattan Neighborhood Network Studios in El Barrio Firehouse in East <laughs> Harlem, New York, I'm Amy Allison. Thanks so much for watching.